it's or positive or negative and then you know if, if that is the, the the narratives we have when we read the paper when we you know look at popular media then you just scare people away from having a real conversation yeah i think that's really the essence of this series and you've articulated that beautifully welcome back i'm mike hill and you're watching futurist world your home for big ideas about the future and how to shape the world of tomorrow Today is going to be special because we're catching up with renowned Dutch futurist speaker and strategist Timon de Jong on the future of human behaviour. From Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Timon is an expert in the strategic business impact of future human behaviour and societal change. Timon is a popular keynote speaker and trainer. His strategic foresight has informed the strategy of organisations like Microsoft, IKEA and Vodafone. Starting his career in journalism, Timon is a subculture enthusiast, which led him to his role as editor-in-chief of Reload magazine. So get ready to expand your horizons and throw open the doors of perception to a brave new world. And remember to keep your finger on the pulse by subscribing to the podcast at futurist.world. Timon, thank you for joining me here in your uh, home. Well, thank you for joining me and uh, <laughs> welcome. Well, not at the office, but at my home, yes. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about human behavior. I'm really interested in terms of how do you think ah. social media is informing the way that we behave? Ah, so social norms are changing. Um, and what we see happening over the you know, past few years already is that, uh, let's say we're in a conversation like we are right now with three, four people, and it's wonderful. But then one of us will get a message in mm -hmm. on your smartwatch, on your phone. And what will happen is that you cannot deny that message on a neural level because you're distracted. It's a bit like a drug addiction. You have to look at that screen. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how interesting the conversation is. You'll be like, oh, wait, no, sorry, no, 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 no. all right, oh, put it back in your pocket and then you're back in the conversation again. But this is, uh, it, it's like a new social norm. It just happens. Subconscious checking out and checking into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're from Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a word for this behavior originating from Australia. It's called fubbing. Have you, have you heard of it yet? No. Ah, all right. So Illuminate me. All right. It's, it's, it's gaining popularity. I yeah. saw it in a Netflix series being used recently a yeah. few times. Uh, so fubbing is um, the act of snubbing someone, oh, yeah. so the act of ignoring someone in <laughs> yeah. a social setting yeah. by looking at your phone yeah. instead of paying attention. Yeah, right. Yeah. This is a, actually a strange phenomenon because we are in a social setting so we're with a group of people but then the message that is another social setting so we're hopping from yeah. a physical to a digital circle yeah. of people because it's not the weather update that we're checking it is a message from a person yes that's coming in um and what we see now is that it's actually interfering with uh what if you're in a business meeting or if you're in a, uh, on a date mm. um so I, I lecture at Utrecht University, I discuss this with my students. Yeah. So I say, what, what are you doing if you're in a date, on a romantic date? What do you do with this digital mm -hmm. addiction behavior? And they say, we, we actually talk about this. Okay. So uh, my students told me to go on a date, to go for dinner. Um, and they'll actually say to each other, phones away. Mm -hmm. And then after the start, they say, all right, phone time. They both, you know, they say to each other, phone time, grab their phone, uh -huh. tap away for a few minutes, gotcha. both at the same time. And then they say, all right. And then phones are away again, and then it's on to the main course, and they might discuss what they just seen online. So people start to consciously manage yeah. uh, their digital addiction. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, as we project forward into the future, this fusion of online, offline, all happening together at the same time is going to become more and more pervasive, isn't it? Well, the thing is, does the fusion work? So if you let it fuse, especially, you know, uh, checking from the physical world into the digital world, you know, and we have our devices, mm -hmm. we might get Google Glass 2.0, 3.0, and it might be even more fusion. Is, mm. it, is that working, yes or no? And I actually think uh, it's gonna be more of a, a discussion point, a talking point between partners when they go on a date, yeah. business meetings. And it, it's actually in, in Silicon Valley, you now see the trend of the device-free meeting. Right. So you enter a meeting and there's actually a physical rack there. You have to put your <laughs> laptop there, your mobile phone there. You have these wonderful boxes now. And I think they're copper grid wired yeah. and your phones don't even get a signal in anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think, yes, there will be fusion, but we'll also see that we're going to manage it more. Yeah. This is unconnected. Mm. And now this is connected. Because if you leave it up to people, it all starts, you know, you might go out into the digital world while I'm still here and yeah. the other way around. So we're yeah. gonna manage that more. Yeah. This is the 
you know, the, the, the experimentation phase where we're learning and we're trying and we're failing and we're slowly getting to the, uh, the etiquette. It's an interesting time in history, I think, you know, in terms of the technology and how it can uh, really accelerate our development, almost to the point of talking about evolution. Do you think about that as a futurist and sort of thinking, where does humanity go over the next 10, 20 years as these technologies are bolted on? Well, I'm not an evolution expert, uh, but what I think is interesting, what we already see happening is that algorithms are start to outperform people that, in the fact that they become smarter than yeah, us. Right. So the thing is, we can accept that technology is stronger than us. So I know I cannot lift uh, that building up there, but if there's a crane, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so technology helping us for physical tasks is fine. Uh, and maybe a calculator is fine to do a little bit of mathematics for us. Uh, but w once algorithms start to make very complicated decisions or very creative decisions, people get uneasy. Yeah. And in, in psychology, there is a term, I don't know if you've heard of it yet, algorithm aversion. No, tell me more. Uh, so there was an interesting interview with uh, Werner Vogels. He's the CTO of Amazon, Chief mm -hmm. Technology Officer of Amazon. And he says, so the recommendation algorithm you now get on Amazon, mm. it's only turned on halfway. Yeah. Because in tests, we, when we put it on full, what people response is when we test it is people say, "What? what you, you're spying on me?" What, no, you're in my head, mm -hmm. so they can predict to you know quite far wow. what you want at that very moment. Uh, and if you do that too much, you scare people away, algorithm aversion, mm -hmm. and then they don't buy anything. So he says, you know, we have to figure out how to fine tune this because. <laughs> The, our content recommendation algorithm that Amazon has is already too advanced. So the question is, uh, now they have this one algorithm and they apply it to all of us. Yeah. But you might be scared by this algorithm very, yeah. very quickly, but I might be totally fine with this. Yeah, you're like, turn it up to 11. Give yeah, turn it up to 11. Yeah. Or it might be that when I buy a book for work, I like the best advice there. But if I buy a gift for my wife, mm -hmm. I would like to have some control and some out of the box stuff. Yeah. So I think the algorithms, you know, they're, they're, they're experimenting, they find you, and we slowly have to get used to them. And we have to see, and unfortunately this is with most technologies, first we have to see a lot of mistakes with the algorithms. So yes. we'll see them being misused, we see mistakes. And then we put, you know, we, we, we hit the brakes and we say, all right, no, stop, this is it. Algorithms, you can do this, but this is our, you know, this is not. Uh, for the algorithm and we're going to put some boundaries here. Whether it's legal, whether it's etiquette, it can be, you know, rules and boundaries. Uh -huh. um, so an example is of course the car. When the car was invented, it took 60 years before they put a seatbelt in. Yeah, right. uh, first we had to have loads of people die in crashes and then it was, hmm, well, maybe put a seatbelt in. Well, the seatbelt was invented before the car was invented. Mm -hmm. In the horse carriages, they had the first seatbelts, but then... So, and I think we'll see a lot of algorithm car crashes yeah. before we put the seatbelts in place. This is fascinating. And I think when we're talking algorithms, uh, some of the female futurists that we've spoken to would say we need to talk about design bias as part of this conversation. So what's your take on design bias? They're completely right. Yeah, they're completely right. Unfortunately, most programmers are male <laughs> of a certain age with a certain background, the, the things they studied. Uh, while these algorithms are being used by the whole of society. So the thing is, how are we going to make sure, you know, the whole of society is programming these algorithms as well? Diversity should be very broad. So not only women, uh, different ethnicities should be in there, different socioeconomic background, different personalities should be in there, um, but also different backgrounds. So not only programmers, but invite psychologists as well. Mm -hmm. a, a few philosophers in there, put a few artists in there. And we mm -hmm. see this happening in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. uh, that they say not only IT schooled people, we get people from all walks of life uh, in there, because then we can get the algorithm perfect and for everyone. What are some of the safeguards that you think we need in place to deal with things like AI, with quantum computing, which just accelerates the whole rate that these systems can work at. Mm. I think a, a great safeguard is to have not only businesses 
you know, so now we have, of course, the big five, the tech companies mm -hmm. developing, you know, most of the AI we are seeing and getting, you know, they have the most money, uh, they have the best programmers. And if you're brilliant and you work for the government, you can earn 10 times as much if you go work for one of the big tech companies. Yeah. So we see all the talent going there, all the money going there. And I don't think it's a good thing that these are commercial multinational corporations mm -hmm. being on the forefront of this technology. Uh, and I think a question will be how can we get a bit back to governments, uh, smaller organizations, NGOs maybe, uh, and how can we make sure that it's a diverse group of people programming these algorithms. So for the tech companies, get psychologists, sociologists, philosophers in there, a, a very diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. Uh, to balance things out. Yeah, that's the sort of humanitarian approach where countries yes. come together in some sort of organized way as yes. well. And uh, I don't, is there any sign of this happening at the moment? On a, on a small scale. Yeah. But I'm, I'm afraid that we have to see... Uh, yeah, I'm an optimist, but I'm afraid that in short short term we will see mistakes, a huge privacy breach, we'll see a war, you know, something digital algorithms going wrong. It might be drones that are being sent in and it's algorithms deciding who, but you know, a big black mirror, the, the Netflix series, uh, we'll see some form of a black mirror scenario somewhere play out, which will be a wake up call. Ah. Same with global warming. We need an island or we, we need some sea level, we, a crazy superstorm. Some we need something like a Chernobyl of you know of this area, you know, just to sort of shock the world yeah. into action. Yeah. yeah, wake up call. Because yeah. if it's just theory, if it's just Black Mirror episodes, I think yeah, all this sci-fi stuff. And, yeah. You know, and, and I love my content recommendation algorithm on Netflix. What are you talking <laughs> about? Google Maps for free, bring me everywhere. Yeah. So I love the algorithm. So. Um, First, we have to experience the bad, not talk about it, we have to experience it, unfortunately, before we really change. Well, that, you that you raised sci-fi, I'm just putting that on the record. You brought it up, so I want to hear more about this. <laughs> oh, when I'm, we talk I, about sci-fi or speculative fiction, is what it terrifies you or inspires you? What, what do you love? So what I noticed, I work mostly for, for um, uh, private corporations, is that if you start talking about 2030, no, 2040, 2050 and beyond, it's just a nice to know story. Mm -hmm. And they just hear, they think, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And then they think, all right, now back to business. So I focus more on, on five to 10 years. So sci-fi, you know, flying cars, we've been talking about that since. Back to the future. Yeah, 19, well, no, early, the 1940s, 1950s. Yeah. The, the Jetsons, and it's still yeah. not there yet. Yeah. So I had our experiments there with people, you know, experimenting with things in their brain, digital technology and, and humans and technology. Yeah, yeah, but we, we also know you brought up the big five tech companies and we yeah. know that a lot of the decision makers at these companies have, you know, kind of visions of the future that are not, you know, based in science. They're based on, you know, projections about what the world might be, you know, so there that informs behavior to some extent, doesn't it? I'm, I'm a bit skeptic. Yeah. Uh, I think human beings, the same with digital technology, you know, we think we're going to connect more and everything will be digital, but then you see people bounce back where they say, no, let's, let's switch everything off. Um, another thing is privacy. Mark Zuckerberg said famously, I think five or six years ago, he said, for our generation, the age of privacy is over. Yeah. And all these experts said privacy is just a fading thing, will be a thing of the past. So what we see now in research among uh, Gen Z, so this is the youngest generation, teenagers, mm -hmm. is that they're more you know, aware of their digital vulnerability and privacy is very much a concern for mm -hmm. them. And we see that the millennial generation, so early 20s to mid 30s, they're the most open generation privacy is less of a concern and we see that it bounces back mm -hmm. and this bounces back is not a popular perspective in Silicon Valley um, and I sometimes use the the analogy of the electric knife mm -hmm. so in the 1960s and 70s <laughs> everything got electrified yeah and the electric knife was yeah, of course you know why would you do this manually yeah. if you can have this electric have an electric knife but who has an electric knife these days and I think many of the things we hear just might be electric knives and will bounce back. <laughs> How do you define privacy these days? Like uh, it's sort of taking on a slightly new meaning, isn't it, in terms of our relationship with it? Well, privacy is actually, so it's, I don't want my data to be misused. Right. Uh, and the thing is, if you use my data well, 
that's okay. So, uh, say these content recommendations algorithms. So, if you go on uh, Netflix, ten hundred thousands of movies. And series, if there's a nice content recommendation scheme, if I'm a bit bored, it just you know, under ten things I'd like to see, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Then it's fine. Use my use my data, and it's an exchange. Uh, but if people get the feeling it's misused mm -hmm. or it's being sold, and so if I have a trusted relationship, you can have my data. But if there's a lack of trust, then privacy becomes a concern. Mm. Well, we're talking human behavior today, the future of human behavior. One of the things that typically has defined us for, you know, for a long time is work, but work's changing really quickly. What are you seeing in terms of the change of work? So there's this famous Oxford University report which came out in 2013. Uh, headlines, the 50% of jobs in 2020 are under fire for automation. And, but it's not happening yet. Um, and I think we'll see some of it. We'll see some of it. We'll see some jobs disappearing because of automation. But I think humans are endlessly creative in finding new ways of keeping themselves busy. Uh, and I'm not afraid at all that we all be unemployed or we go to a 10-hour you know, a, a, a work week, uh, for example. That relates to education, the future of education as well, I think, because as we have more time and opportunity to be creative, we may have, you know, education takes on possibly a new meaning as well. How do you see things changing in education? I think what we'll see the next 10 years is that education is very much, it used to be very much about IQ. You know, we're going to teach you mathematics, language, history, so things that you can, you know, um, um, <laughs> knowledge. Uh, and I'll see, I think we'll see a switch to the EQ. Ah, the EQ. Yeah. Uh, why? Because we live in a so-called uncertain world. If we look at mental health developments, uh, the past 10 years and the projections for the next 10 years, I think one of the greatest gifts you can give to your children or to the young generations is that they can deal with uncertainty. Yeah. That they're agile mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of, you know, the job you might you know, be in higher education for it might disappear, but then are you agile enough to switch jobs? Um, are you open to a lot of changes? Are you open to travel? Uh, are you open for different experiences? Um, and are you able to stay mentally healthy uh, when you cannot find the perfect job, when you cannot find the perfect partner, when your life is not perfect? And if you look at especially among uh, youngsters in their 20s, um, burnouts, depression, suicide rates, it, it, it's not looking good. Uh, and I think education is going to play a huge role in, 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 in helping us as a society and the next generation um, to yeah. stay sane, uh, mental, mental well-being. Yeah, I really like that uh, profile of the future that you're painting there. Is there a role for technology in that as well? If some early indicators that sometimes yeah. the wearable tech and yeah, the tech is, back able, to, yeah, yeah, you right. know, is able yeah. to actually help us with our mental health because it might be picking up on signs and signals that you know your, yeah, that's your the, human companions are not seeing yeah that is the emotion ai the emotion artificial intelligence so that is uh, technology actually measuring how we're feeling right yeah. now yeah. Uh, and this is already you know there, there are quite a few companies working on this and it's already being used in practice uh, at this moment, uh, Amazon is working on a wearable that can measure your emotions. So your Alexa or Apple with Siri, that your digital mm -hmm. assistant can hear from your voice how you're feeling and then use that to customize and personalize. Mm -hmm. um, emotion AI is being used in job interviews, digital job mm -hmm. interviews. So you're being interviewed on video and it can analyze your emotions in the job interview. Border security is working with that. So you don't have a human border agent anymore. You have a digital screening yeah. so it can see are you lying <laughs> are you nervous are you is there something wrong yeah and then you pick that line and then there's still a human agent yeah. there to to have a chat with you or you have to open your suitcase so emotion ai is coming but it will be only a tool so many people say is it going to replace all you know human emotion interaction and that you know we're you know is that then going to replace many of the human interaction we have no i don't think so it'll mm -hmm. be a tool yeah 
like a calculator in the hand of a mathematician. Mm. Yeah, and it sounds like it could be quite a useful tool if it's used for good. So Again, if yeah. it's used for good. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So what are the key principles we need to apply to future-proof against you know, some of these uh, technologies and other things that are now starting to influence human behavior? Well, that's, that's quite simple. We have to talk more about the future. Um, and I think when you look at the future, you have to look at, you know, it's a broad, it's connecting dots uh, and it, it, you have to have a broad outlook. So you have to look at what's happening in demographics, the, of course, the, the, the environment, you have to look at the economy, uh, you have to look at technological developments, and you cannot look at one thing. You have to look across everything. Um, and you need a few experts uh, to help you with that. And preferably, so I'm an, I'm an, out, an outside expert, but I wish there'd be more internal experts at companies. So what you're talking about is weaving futurism into the you know, fabric of society. And I think that that's really important. I think if we could get it a bit more embedded inside organizations and also in, in governments. I don't say have a ministry of the future, but have people uh, make sure that conversation is taking place more often and make it a bit fun instead of, you know, if you talk about the future, oh, it's so scary, this VUCA, uncertain, post-truth <laughs> world. Yeah. And, you know, many times about the future, it's, it's very much a black and white narrative or technology is going to solve everything. The singularity university, you know, you know when technology, yeah. you know, when everything starts matching up and all these algorithms start talking to each other, all problems are, are solved. Mm -hmm. And then we have the dystopian, uh, you know, the, the global warming is coming, we can't stop it. The technologies, the algorithms, you know, are coming. If you look at global tensions, we're going to have World War Three and Four. So the future world doomed and it's or positive or negative. And then, you know, if, if that is the, the, the narratives we have when we read the paper, when we, you know, look at popular media, then you just scare people away from having a real conversation. Yeah, I think that's really the essence of this series and you've articulated that beautifully. So what gives you the most hope when you think about the future of human behavior and how things are changing? Um, well, two things. One is that people are, I, I believe in the good of people, that people are in essence good people and will take care of each other in, in times of need. Uh, and the other one is that people are endlessly creative in finding solutions. So if you say, right, there is technology coming and it's taking these kinds of jobs away, I am 100% positive that we'll find another set of jobs. They'll get created because we are such creative human beings. Mm -hmm. There are a few examples out there. One of my favorites is the job of a nail technician. I don't know if you know what a nail yeah. technician is in a nail or a nail salon, and the nail technician is mm -hmm. that way. So this job as a profession did not exist before the year 1970. So in the 1960s, it did not exist. Uh, then in the 70s, in the United States, nail salons started what started coming up because there was a, a, a large population of Vietnamese refugees uh, who were unemployed, didn't speak the language uh, and, and needed you know, a, a, a profession, something to do, be part of society. Um, and these nail salons uh, came up from the Vietnamese uh, community in the United States. And now it's a spread over the world and it's not definitely not a Vietnamese thing anymore. Um, and now if you look at uh, the United States alone, I have the United States figures here, uh, there are 400,000 nail technicians employed in the <laughs> wow. United States, 400,000, and it's a billion dollar industry. Mm. Now, if you would have said in the 1960s, people are going to spend hundreds of dollars a year on their nails, actually going to a physical place, a nail salon, and there will be a professional there who is just specialized in fingernails <laughs> or toenails. People say, hey, you're crazy. It'd be the same as I say, you go to an earlobe technician in uh, 2030 <laughs> yeah. to spend lots of money on a beautiful earlobe. You'd be like, what are you talking about? So these are things, I call them the jobs you cannot predict. <laughs> nail technician could not have been predicted in 2060, but still we are 400,000 people. And then Donald Trump, there he is again. He's still talking about the war on coal, the coal mining industry. There are only 75,000 people working in the coal mine industry in the United States. Compared so, to 400,000 yeah, nail, nail technicians. <laughs> so he's talking about the war on coal and the coal miners going out of a job. So it, it is, uh, well, yeah, that is the narrative that I think, so there's a very negative narrative and we can turn it around and, and make it into a positive one. We'll be fine. And what will be the nail technician of the future? <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me today about the future of human behavior. Just one last question before yes. we wrap it up. 
Uh, you know, I think futurism has such a big role to play just in terms of helping us think about better futures. Can you tell me about how that plays out for you and what you see in your travels? Ah, well, I think futurism as a word and futurist, I, I actually don't use it that often. Um, so uh, I run a small company and I call it strategic foresight. Uh -huh. Uh, and I'm a social psychologist specializing in the future of human behavior. Yeah. And I think one of the problems with futurism, it sounds a big, vagueish, yeah. uh, like trend watcher, um, futurologist. There are a few of these vague terms out there, and yeah. they do not fit in the, you know, in the academia, in the business world. People look at it, and I think uh, if we can frame it better. Um, if we can create a better narrative around thinking about the future as a profession and for finding its role in governments and in businesses, mm -hmm. I think that could solve a lot of, um, well, not problems, but it could solve like the, the field of futurism. It could find a better place and be more useful to all. Tuan, thank you so much for all spending right. time with me today, talking the future it of human behavior. It was an absolute behavior. pleasure. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap on the future of human behavior with Timon de Jong. But before you go, it's your time to shine. We're here to make a change, but we need your help. The purpose of this series is to move humanity forward, think bigger and cast our minds into the future. So we'd love to know what made the biggest impression on you from today's conversation. Was it the new norms in balancing device time with human relationships? Or the prospect of a catastrophic breach to our digital privacy? Maybe it was the insights around the development of new jobs like the billion dollar industry created by Nailtechs in the US. The best conversations happen right now. So please get involved, share a comment, and share the love. And another great place to join the conversation and find more epic content is at futurist.world. And when you're there, be sure to sign up for access to exclusive content and delectable giveaways, including a box of Tony's Chocolate Only slave-free Dutch chocolate. Yum. And you can also find us on all the usual social media channels via the links below. Thanks again for joining us. The future is out there and see you next time on Futurist World.